All right, we're going to uh, move on to our second uh, talk this morning. Uh, this is going to be uh, from uh, Sarah Heinema, who's going to be speaking on variants of bodily subjects, embodiment, expression, and empathy. Thank you, uh, and I want to uh, begin by saying that I'm very happy and honored to be invited and uh, have the opportunity to present some of my uh, thoughts about some of my un understanding of uh, Husserl's discourse of uh, bodies and embodiment. Uh, uh, I have a paper, so I will read the paper. I don't have a, uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, read readable presentation, neither a PowerPoint or a handout. So it's going to be a talk. One of the strengths of contemporary phenomenology is a rich conceptual arsenal that it offers for the analysis of bodily aspects of human experience. The base of this conceptual arsenal is in the methodology that Edmund Husserl famously developed at the beginning of last, uh, of last century uh, for, the, uh, for the analysis of sense constitution and more precisely for the constitution of spatiality and and thinghood originally, but then applied with his pupils in the inquiry of many different sorts of experiencing, including bodily experiences and experiences of bodies, different types of bodies. Even though several pupils and collaborators, most importantly Edith Stein, Eugen Fink, and Martin Heidegger, later departed from the strictly Husserlian methodology and engaged in philosophical projects of different sorts, their discussions of human bodies remained indebted to the original account that we find in Husserl's uh, texts, Husserl's manuscripts and his publications. In addition to the Husserlian sources, contemporary phenomenology of embodiment also draws heavily from the subsequent inquiries that French phenomenologists, Emmanuel Levinas, Jean-Paul Sartre, Merle Ponty, Michel Henry, and Jean-Luc Marion, for example, have conducted on the basis of Husserl's groundbreaking studies. And uh, these have been both constructive and uh, critical, of course. Uh, and the many uses that we find in contemporary uh, phenomenology of, of the Husserlian concepts are uh, like uh, in philosophy of perception on the one hand, but then also in political philosophy and uh, some discuss discussions that have ethical dimensions. So it's a very large area in which these uh, uh, concepts are used. And what I try to do, what I will do here is I want to go back to this original analysis and uh, present some of my readings of what he's actually saying about the body. Uh, the main result of uh, Husserlian phenomenology in respect to embodiment uh, are often reduced, the main results are often reduced to a simple opposition between body as a subject of experiencing and the body as an object of knowledge. Informed, this opposition is informed by the epistemological distinction between subjective and objective qualities of things and the ontological distinction between subjective and objective being. Another dominant contrast in contemporary phenomenology is that between the lived body, lib, invested with psychic powers, and the mere material thing, körper, dominated by efficient causality. These oppositional senses serve many different arguments in contemporary theorization, and they are very useful. However, if their constitutional conditions and the complexity of their mutual relations are bypassed or not if we don't give enough uh, attention to them, they may obstruct philosophical progress instead of opening up new avenues. This is crucial, thus it is crucial to the retrace the explication of these distinctions, even, even oppositional distinctions, in Husserl's original exposition. And this is what I, I aim, aim at doing here. The main teaching in the second volume, volume of ideas in Husserl's second volume of ideas, in the second volume of Husserl's ideas, is that both human bodies and animal bodies can be apprehended in two alternative ways, either as psychophysical unities, or uh, either as psycho psychophysical unities uh, involving two types of processes, physical and psychophysical, 
or else as expressive wholes in which the spiritual and the material are comprehensively intertwined. So there are, as if, two different ways of apprehending both human and animal bodies. One in which uh, the body is uh, understood as a psychophysical unit, unity which involves two types of processes and the other as an, as an expressive whole which then has uh, spirituality and materiality intertwined in a specific way. In the first case, we, we have two, a two-layer identity. The psychics is layered upon the physical and causally dependent on it. In the second case, no two layers, no two such layers can be distinguished. Spiritual sense permeates matter through and through, and no non-spiritual layer or part stands out. In, in ideas two, Sussel characterizes the latter phenomenon as follows. So this is the, uh, uh, the phenomenon which is not a two-layered unit. He writes, I hear the other speaking, so you hear me speaking. I hear the other speaking. See his gesture, facial gestures, attribute to him such and such conscious lived experiences and acts, and let myself be motivated by them in this or that way. The facial gestures are seen facial gestures, and they are intermediately bearers of sense for the other's consciousness, his will, which in empathy is characterized as the actual will of the, this person and as a will which addresses me in communication." Unquote. Who's, of course, the first type of apprehension, so the two-layered apprehension of the psychophysical unit, naturalistic, and the second apprehension, that is the apprehension of a, a whole which, in which the material and the spiritual are intertwined, personalistic, and argues that the naturalistic apprehension grounds modern scientific psychology and related disciplines, while the personalistic apprehension grounds all our communicative practical dealings with other living beings, including the scientific practice itself as an intersubjectivic enterprise, so a communicative enterprise between persons interested in truth or knowledge. The main question of Ideas 2 then concerns the relations between the two, these two types of apprehensions, which both have a central role in our worldly dealings and our pursuit of knowledge. So then the question becomes how these two different ways of apprehending uh, living beings, bodies, living bodies, uh, uh, are related. Thus, the naturalistic, causalistic account of the human body and the animal body is not abandoned or rejected by Husserl in favor of the personalistic account, as is sometimes claimed. Rather, since both crucially belong to our conscious lives and to our scientific dealings, the task of the phenomenologist is to chart their limits and to study their conditions of possibility and their mutual relations. So in my understanding, Husserl's ideas too distinguishes between two different types of systems or wholes. The living being as a psychophysical system and the living being as an expressive unity of spirit and sensible matter. The first one is a layered unit, unity in which the psychic is layered upon the physical. And the second one is not a layered unity. So the spiritual is not a layer upon the material. Consequently, we can apprehend the body of a human being in two different ways. Either the living body is conceived as a physical foundation that sustains psychic states, processes and dispositions, and determines their courses in this or that, ma in this or that manner, or else the body is grasped as an expressive whole that carries spiritual sense in all its parts and parcels. In the former case, there is a basic layer of purely material, physical or electrochemical or whatever neural being that operates independently of the mental organization characterized, characteristic of the higher layer or the higher layers. In the second case, no purely material elements or constituents can be distinguished in the spiritual organization of the whole. 
Husserl characterizes the personalistic, so the latter apprehension of the human body by comparing it to the way in which we grasp units of, of written and spoken languages. So he tries to kind of uh, make it more understandable by an analogy to language and linguistic uh, units, such as words and texts. And I have a small quote from, the, uh, from this volume, just to kind of show you that, uh, how he develops this analogy. Um, he writes, the imprinted page or the spoken le lecture, such as this one. So the imprinted page or the spoken lecture is not a connected unity, duality or word, sound and sense, but rather each word has its sense. Exactly the same holds for the unity of man or woman. It is not that the living body is an undifferentiated physical unity, undifferentiated from the standpoint of its sense, from the standpoint of the spirit. That rather, the physical unity of the living body there, so the life there, is multiply articulated, and the articulation is that of sense, which means that it is not a kind that is to be found within the physical attitude, so within the naturalistic, physicalistic attitude, the physical attitude, unquote. So this was a kind of uh, just a uh, fragment from this analogy that he offers to us uh, in order for us to understand uh, the, the difference between the two different ways of apprehending, articulating uh, living bodies as we encounter them. By this analogy, Husserl explicates his main insight, according to which the mental life that we capture in the bodily gestures and postures of living beings when we are dealing with them in communication, is not originally given to us as an appendix to the physical being, but is given as an organi organi organizing power. And I want to read another uh, 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 quote to you, because I just want to show how he, uh, how he uh, articulates this idea. Uh, so this, here it comes. The spiritual is not a second something. It is not an appendix, but is precisely animating. And the unity is not a connection of two, but on the contrary, one and only one is there. Physical being can be grasped for itself while carrying out the existential thesis that is appropriate to it. By means of the natural attitude, as natural being, as thingly being, but what we have here is not a surplus which would be posited on the top of the physical, but rather this is spiritual being which essentially includes the senses, but which one, once again does not include it as part, the way one physical thing is part of another." Unquote. While dealing between these two different senses of the lived body, two different articulations that we can give to the lived body, the naturalistic sense of the body as a psychophysical unit, compound unit, and the personalistic sense of the body as a signifying expression, Husserl also argues that the former sense is constitutionally dependent on the latter. So the naturalistic apprehension depends on the personalistic in a specific sense. According to him, the naturalistic apprehension of living beings, their psychic and physiological properties is not a self-sufficient formation, but is dependent on the more profound personalistic attitude. So uh, just to concretize it, if you, if you wouldn't be able to uh, enter into the personalistic attitude at all, then you wouldn't be able to apprehend any bodies in a naturalistic way either. So you need to be able to uh, have the uh, uh, personalistic attitude in your kind of uh, repertoire. In the second volume of DS, so still here, the thesis is formulated by the concepts of attitude as follows. And this is a kind of well-known place where uh, where what we, we are, that we often encounter in, in uh, contemporary discussions also. So once again, a quote. Upon closer scrutiny, it will, be, it, it will even appear that there are not here two attitudes with equal right and of the same order, or two perfectly equal apperceptions 
which at once penetrate one another. But that the naturalistic attitude is in fact subordinated to the personalistic and that the former only acquires by means of an abstraction or rather by means of a kind of self-forgetfulness of the personal ego, a certain autonomy, whereby it proceeds illegitimately to absolute, absolutize its world, that is nature, unquote. So the point is that the naturalistic attitude uh, uh, may seem self-sufficient, but this is based on a self-forgetfulness of, of, uh, of the ego in its personalistic dealings. This argument seems to be in direct opposition, it may seem to be in direct opposition to the natural scientific paradigm according to which our psychic, mental and spiritual life, however it is organized, results from and remains dependent on the purely physical processes of the human brain, of the neural makeup of the human organism. The opposition, however, is merely seeming sin, since the dependence relations discussed by Husserl and the natural scientist are very different in kind, whereas Husserl studies dependence relations between different senses of bodily being, the natural scientist conception concerns the causal functional relations of determination between two different types of real properties, the mental properties of veracity, aboutness, or phenomenality, for example, and the physical properties of location, electric charge, intensity, length, or whatever they might be. However, on the basis of the naturalist, naturalist, natural scientific paradigm of explanation, one can put forward a comprehensive ontological or metaphysical theory according to which all being, and consequently all, also all psychic, mental, and spiritual being, depends on the fundamental being of purely physical entities or forces and forces. This is not a natural scientific position, but is an ontological position of modern physicalism. It, in its conception, the mental is either identical with the physical or else merely epi an epiphenomenal or emergent property of the physical without any power to de determine the latter. So the physical is independent of the, um, of the psychic in this, way, in this sense. Against this, Husserl argues that all physicalistic arguments take for granted the possibility of, of individuating physical being physical entities, physical events, physical processes, independently of all reference to individual minds or spirits. This, he claims, is a groundless process. In his analysis, physical individuation in terms of position in objective space-time and in terms of causal roles remains dependent on individuation by the here and the now and these in turn refer back to subjective individuation, that is individuation of experiences and experiencing subject and ult subjects and ultimately to the individuation of streams of pure consciousness. In ideas to this argument about the primacy of subjective individuation in respect to objective spatial temporal individuation is compressed as follows. And I want to show you how he uh, formulates it by a quote. What distinguishes two things that are alike in the real causes nexus, which presupposes, what distinguishes two things that are alike is the real causal nexus, which presupposes the here and the now. And with that, we are led back necessarily to an individuating subjectivity, whether solitary or an intersubjective one with respect to which all determina determinateness is constituted in the position of location and time. No thing has its individuality in itself, unquote. And then even more explicitly a few pages below he writes, objective thinghood is determined physicalistically, but it is determined as this only in relation to consciousness and the conscious subject. All determination refers back to here and now and consequently to some subject or nexus of subjects, unquote. Husserl's treatment here rests on his account of the constitution of the unity of 
the stream of consciousness and the immanent time as its basic structure. In his account, all individuation of physical things, events, processes, and other types of realities and objective unified space-time rests on the primary individuation of subjects, and these in turn are grounded in the fundamental individuation of streams of consciousness with their egoic poles. The main implication to his, to this th of this theory of individuation to the philosophy of embodiment is the insight that bodily persons are not individuated by their positions in objective space-time or in causal nexuses, but are individuated by their subjective modes of taking position and responding to what is given in experience and of yielding to or withstanding from what draws them. Rather than being differentiated by the physical or psychophysical properties, substances or essences, bodily subjects are distinguished by their unique ways or styles in which they intentionally relate to constantly altering environing circumstances in their gesture in acting and to themselves as constantly developing sources of intending. Uh, and I skip some pages in order to uh, uh, be able to say uh, something about the, uh, another kind of uh, tension in Husserl's account of uh, embodiment. Just to uh, wrap up something from that we have uh, got this far. Uh, then I go to the last uh, section of the paper. What we have seen, I think, I hope, um, we have seen that in Husserl's account, embodiment is not one phenomenon, but involves two core phenomena. The body as a natural, we could perhaps say, organism, a psychophysical unit on the one hand, and the body as an expressive whole on the other hand. These two phenomena have their own grounds, regions, and principles, and they have their own also areas of application. And here we come to the distinction between the uh, natural sciences and the sciences of the human sciences or the Geisteswissenschaften uh, with, with, with which he was uh, then dealing in that time. We have also clarified the relations between the two phenomena and seen that instead of rejecting the naturalistic explanation of the living body, uh, Husserl works to specify the conditions or possibility of this account, of this way of apprehending, and to chart its limits. He does not dismiss the naturalistic explications as misleading or invalid. He merely argues that it is not self-sufficient, but remains one-sidedly dependent on the personalistic apprehension of the living body. So there is not a dismissal of the naturalistic way of studying uh, human or animal bodies but rather an attempt to keep two different uh, ways of apprehending them dis distinct and then in order to try to see their relations. So I think there is a very different kind of uh, uh, relation to the natural sciences also in, uh, in the account of body that, that we find, for example, in Heidegger's uh, discussions. Uh, and so I have like uh, 20 minutes. Okay, so I can then, and then read the. Okay, good. Okay. I want to present another tension in this discourse on embodiment and, and try to kind of figure out what is happening there. Hutz's analysis of embodiment also harbors another crucial distinction. This is a distinction uh, between the givingness of one's own body and the givingness of the other living body, be it human or animal. Like the distinction between the naturalistic and the personalistic apprehensions of living bodies, this distinction too is sometimes simplified as a simple opposition. But rather than saying that he had these two opposite uh, views, it is sometimes argued that in his early works, uh, most importantly perhaps in the ideas and Cartesian meditations, they're not early works, but let's say mature uh, early works, Husserl put forward a solipsistic or egocentric account of embodiment, but then later distanced himself from this or uh, 
just became a little uh, self-critical and de developed a more rela relational or dialogical understanding of human embodiment. In order to see what is involved in this second distinction between one's, the, the givenness of one's own body and the givenness of all other living bodies, it is necessary to study somewhat closer the order in which the different senses of living body are constituted according to Husserl. So it's, it's a question of the constitutive order, I think, that one has to pay attention to. In my understanding, Husserl argues effectively both in ideas in, in ideas and in the Cartesian meditations, that all sense of living bodiliness, both naturalistically apprehended and personalistically apprehended, depends on the primary sense of my own living body and on the empathetic sense of another living body, which is grounded on the fundamental sense of my own living body. And this is sometimes blurred because people I think wrongly read Cartesian meditations, the fifth meditation, as claiming that the sense of one's own living body is constituted on the basis of the physical thing, or the mere physical thing. Uh, and I think this is a misunderstanding, the sense of one's own living body, which is a kind of basic sense of living bodiliness that he finds in this constitutive order, is not, ground, is not founded on the physical thing in the sense that we find in uh, ideas one, ideas two, in the, the sense explicated in ideas uh, two. So I want to say something about this. On this ground, who says, on this ground, so mm, uh, that both the naturalistic apprehension and the personalistic apprehension depend on the sense of one's own living body, uh, Husserl's account of the ultimate foundation of the sense of embodiment can be characterized as individualistic or solipsistic. But one should be very careful with these words. I mean, they are misleading if one takes any, any ordinary uh, understanding of them. Since uh, by sense foundation, Husserl does not mean any axiom from which other senses could be derived by means of whatever process but means a necessarily starting point, necessary condition on, on the basis of which further constitutive se steps become possible and on, on, in which new senses, are, is produ new senses produced. So the argument is that our concrete everyday experience, experiences as well as our scientific, philosophical and aesthetic understandings of living bodies involve several senses of bodily being that all enrich and develop the primitive, one could perhaps say, sense of self-embodiment that we then uh, find described in uh, the fifth meditation. Both tactile and kinesthetic sensations are needed for the, for the constitution, of, constitution of this primitive sense. The former provide a pre-objective primitive spatiality and the latter provide a sense of spontaneous movement and then both are needed in the understanding of the body as a sensing, self-governing, moving unit. Both are necessary for the constitution of sense organs and the body as an organ that uh, unites these organs, an organ of movement and action. On the basis of this, these two types of sensations, our bodies are constituted primarily as double or self-diverting beings, both sensing and sensible, both perceiving and perceivable at the same time. This means that the consciousness that we would lack the sense of its own living bodiliness could not establish the sense of another living body and thus could not experience any other being as a living being. Husserl even gives an example of such a consciousness in the second volume of ideas in order to highlight the dependency of the sense of living on tact tactility. He proposes that we imagine a consciousness, the only sense of which would be vision, that is a consciousness that would lack tactile sensations altogether. Such a consciousness, he argues, could not perceive its own body as living, and in so far as the sense of one's own living bodiliness is necessary for the constitution of the sense of another living body, as he argues that it is. 
this consciousness would not have any living bodies in its fields of, field of experiencing. Husserl's argument about the constitutive primacy of, one's, of the sense of one's own body is sometimes presented as an early view that he later abandoned. For this reason, it is important to study some paragraphs from his late publications. In the, cart, in the crisis of the European sciences and transcendental phenomenology, we read, for example, as follows. So this is just to show you that this is not a view that he later abandoned or later uh, compromised for some other ends. He writes, everyone experiences the embodiment of souls in original fashion only in his own case. What properly and essentially makes up the character of living body, I experience only in my own living body, namely in my constant and immediate holding sway over my surroundings through this physical body alone. Only it is given to me originally and meaningfully as organ and as articulated into particular organs. Unquote. So the term physical body here should not be confused with the idea of physical body that we find explicated in, uh, in uh, Cartesian meditations. So that was just one uh, side mark. The other body is grasped as living when the primitive sense of living as sensing as constituted in one, my, my own case, so self-sensing, self uh, finding oneself as through sensation as a sensed, as a sensing being is transferred over from one's own body to another corporeal body in an environing space. And this other body there in space cannot be a phys mere, mere physical thing because the constitution of a mere physical thing depends on other living beings. So this has to be another sense of uh, physical than the one uh, articulated in, uh, in IDS2. The transfer is motivated by the si uh, similarity of perceived moments, movements. Some things that I detect and observe in space resemble my own living body and its sensory organs in their perceived movements, in a, in a perceived way of moving. A body over there reacts to external stimulation in the same way as my own arms and hands. And when it bumps into another thing, it does not hold or bounce back, but restores its balance and circumvents the obstacle. And these descriptions, of course, depend on the idea of uh, another living body. So in that sense, one, in order to be, if one would want to be very precise, one would have to avoid such vocabulary. The point, however, is that I find another body moving in uh, the space uh, analogous in its movement, in its perceived movements to my own bodily movements. Such behavioral motil similarities motivate a complex of synthetic experience, synthesizing experiences that terminate, uh, terminates in an act in which a sense of sensing is transferred over to a body perceived at a distance. So the sense of sensing, it too, is a sensing being is transferred over uh, on the basis of this, uh, motivated by this uh, uh, detected similarity in the movements. As a result, a new type of being is given to me, a body with its own systems of sensations and appearance systems, sensation that I cannot have or live through, but that are given to me via the things, movements and behaviors. This is not an inferential step but that produces a new proposition, but an associative synthesis. The living thing detected in perception does not appear as an amalgam or compound of two separate realities, one psychic and the other physical, nor as a two-layered psychophysical reality. The transfer of sense reorganizes the object. So it is giving uh, not as a layered reality, but a uh, reality in which each movement uh, carries sense. Such conceptualization, I mean, the conceptualizations uh, in which the uh, sensible would be a, uh, an uh, ad ad addition to the physical belong to the naturalistic 
apprehension, not the straightforward perception, and they depend on the goals, the methods, and the techniques of uh, certain practices. Instead of manifesting itself as a compounded or layered structure, the living being appears as a uniform whole of governed movements, meaningful gestures, and significant behaviors. And this is a result of the reorganization, which is motivated by the perceived analogy in the ways of moving. So perhaps I, I end here, and uh, then we have how much time we have. Uh, we would have uh, over 20 minutes for questions. OK, OK, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I was very fast. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so, two questions. First is very simple. Do you think that the body that is um, taken as that sorry that the the concept of body that that Husserl is using in the Cartesian meditations is not that of the physical body were you implying that it was the personalist personalistic uh, self-image that he's using well, in the Cartesian uh, meditations or are you saying it's a totally different construct uh, okay. from what we get in ideas can too? you wait with the second question yeah I'll wait. I have very Bad memory. Okay. So I, I mean immediately forget what you asked when you go to the second question. Okay. So I meant that when he when he when he well he makes he articulates a sense of uh, living bodiness by uh, by introducing this abstractive uh, reduction to the sphere of onus, uh, where he's, the idea is that we we exclude all sense that depends on other living other other subjects. And we uh, find ourselves in a kind of abstractive, mm -hmm. through this abstractive uh, reduction in a, we are able to kind of isolate uh, an element of experience mm -hmm. in which uh, the only li living body, uh, in which the only living body is my own body. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we abstract the all sense of uh, other subjects, then we, we have to put aside all conceptualizations of the sciences because the conceptualizations of the sciences depend in their objectivity on the uh, being on the other subjects. So in this way, we 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 lose. We can't. It, it can't be the uh, the the sense of psychophysical body that is explicated in ideas too. So the naturalistic apprehension. So it has to be something else. Uh, so it is the uh, physical body uh, uh, as a uh, object of sensations and perceptions, which are not intersubjective, uh, uh, which, are, which, which don't have the intersubjective mm -hmm. kind of framework for them. And this he actually uh, explicates in experience and judgment. Okay. So it's not that we... Uh, abandon the naturalistic concept of the body whenever we are returning uh, to that. Uh, that um, it, it, it's that we, and it's also not that we turn to the full personalistic. No, no, of the no. Body. It, it, but, it's just no. a layer of sensations. It's, it, yeah, it, it's a kind of. Well, it's it's not even a layer. Of, well, it's more than a layer of sensations because it's something that depends on sensations. Mm. But it is constituted. Uh, completely independently on any reference to others. So mm -hmm. if one is in the opinion that such a constitution mm -hmm. is impossible, mm -hmm. then that, that step is impossible. Yeah. But for him, it seems to be possible. Yeah, could it be that this is, isn't just a mute layer of sensations because it's an awareness of one's body in the personalistic mode that is as something that is expressive and can express. It's just you're considering it, it doing these expressive acts in isolation without any recognition or anything from another in that case. But in, in, if, this, if this abstractive uh, isolation is in operation, then it is not, there is no sense of persons in, in that sense that is explicated in ideas too. So there is neither this uh, scientific object called physical thing, nor are there persons 
because th these are these are both outcome from this empathetic I see. Uh, step. This is how I see. I see okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. But it might be uh, you had another question. Oh well. Um, I mean, you have so time, we kind of so, so, so. got into the other question. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was thinking that one way of reading the self in the in the Cartesian meditations is that of an expressive self that already has this sort of duality built into it. So you can experience yourself as both touched and being touched all by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you can experience yourself as expressing anger all by yourself, right? So you're um, on a deserted well, I, island and you're shaking your fist at the heavens, uh, but no one there is recognizing you. And so there's a kind of duality there, one of yourself as expressing and of a bodily um, expression or or of the state as being expressed. Okay, but I, I think like that, that the duality of the sense sensing is different from the duality. The, the kind of just the, the kind of the 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 concept of sense sensing is different from the sen concept of expressed expressing, mm -hmm. okay. and the latter ne needs. But we have to have the constitution of the other body in order to have the expressed expressing. Uh, okay. So my own body as expressive depends. I have to have the other mm -hmm. in order to experience my own body as expressive yeah. because it, it, well, in, a, in a layman's terms, it is expressive for the other primarily, I would think I so. That. So there is this kind of zigzag movement, I think, what is happening is that one's own sensing, sensed body allows us to constitute the other sensing, sensed body, mm -hmm. and that gives us the sense of expressive mm -hmm. in, okay. in also in relation to okay. ourselves. Great. Thank you very much. So I would argue that. Uh, thank you a lot for the presentation. I really enjoyed that. So I have a concern. I'm not sure if this is a concern with Husserl's approach or if it's just a concern that kind of stems from a few remarks Husserl makes in Cartesian meditations about how we perceive other bodies. And it has to do with his remarks about perceiving something as a pseudo-organism. So he has a few remarks where he says, uh, if a body is different or if a body moves in an inharmonious way, we perceive it as a pseudo-organism. And I think that's a fairly accurate account of what can occur. But I'm interested in what this ends up telling us about this distinction between the psychophysical, or the body as psychophysical and the body as expressive, specifically in relation to cases of things like chronic illness and disability. So, I mean, it's well documented that a lot of people with physical disabilities or physical impairments are often kind of infantilized, they're kind of desubjectivized in a certain sense. People in wheelchairs often report that if there's someone with them, say, pushing the wheelchair, that's always the person who's addressed, right? They're never addressed as the subject. Um, in cases of people who have, say, motor tremors or some kind of speech impediment, there's a sense in which the expressive nature of their body is kind of reduced and they're not taken as a fully expressive subject. But I think in these cases, sometimes that subjectivity, that expressive subjectivity can be restored by granting the other a certain kind of psychophysical knowledge of this person's condition. So say in the case of um, addressing someone with Parkinson's who has tremors and slow movement, it's very easy for us to kind of desubjectivize that person in a certain sense. Right? There's a sense in which their bodily expression um, just doesn't show up to us as expression. But by having knowledge then of what the condition is and what the, um, what the symptoms of that condition are and why, say, the tremors are happening and things like that, there's a sense in which the expressive body can be restored through that psychophysical understanding of the body. And I'm not sure what that does with the kind of distinction you're trying to draw here and how that complicates that distinction. Uh, well, I haven't, well, I, I'm trying to think through these kind of diverse bodies. So I'm trying to think through the problems that the kind of fact that our bodies come in different variations and not just kind of that your body is different from my, but that my body is different than it was 30 years ago and will be very different in 20 years. So I'm trying to think the, the, what, what kinds of problems these, or what kinds of challenges these, uh, this fact uh, pre presents to the Husserlian account. And if if he would, if his concepts could be used uh, to at least um, make sense of some of these uh, these challenge, uh, answer to some of these challenges. Uh, 
but I haven't really kind of thought uh, the, the specific idea that the, the psychophysical knowledge or psychophysical, uh, not just knowledge, but also perhaps training uh, allows us to kind of as if recover the person, uh, which we, for some reason, for a certain kind of habitual uh, expectations about what kinds of uh, movements are similar to ours then, then somehow block. I, have, I haven't really uh, worked through that, but it's a very, uh, I mean, it's a good question. And, and I, I, think, I, I don't think it's uh, obvious that uh, his distinction between psychophysical and expressive would not be able to answer that because I think he's saying that uh, we need both uh, for many different kinds of practices. So not just uh, scientific practices, but also everyday practices, because our everyday practices also depend on the scientific knowledge, not just in this case, but in many cases. So I think his uh, account is actually quite uh, open to these um, uh, specific cases in, in which the sciences inform us about something that our uh, pre-scientific, if we ever, if we even have that anymore, our pre-scientific relations Mm. Uh, inform us about some uh, 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 problems of, of, uh, of relating uh, in, in a way that doesn't uh, 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 categorize uh, bodies uh, in, in, a, in a way, um, in a habitual way. But I, I haven't really kind of uh, worked through uh, and a proper answer to this. But I, I'm quite optimistic about his uh, distinction between the psychophysical uh, appreh apprehension and, and the expressive, because they have this uh, mutual, uh, they, 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 the dependence relation is only that if you, it, it's a kind of a dependence of possibility. So if you, could, if you wouldn't be able to apprehend any other body as expressive, then you would not be able to have any, any naturalistic understanding of anybody. So uh, it's just about this, uh, it's just a condition of possibility for the naturalistic apprehension. Thank you. But this wasn't a good answer, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you very much for, for this. I uh, was uh, especially struck by your efforts to bring the the two first attitudes together, the naturalistic and the and the um, personalistic attitude, by um, looking toward a third kind of account, uh, in which you've got then this uh, high dependency going between my body and the body of the other, and um, it seems like that's an interesting, a really important move, and an interesting move. And I'd like to explore that a little bit further. Um, this may be a place where the Cartesian meditations, unlike many other areas, isn't actually a help to us. Uh, and that is that uh, in order to get that whole dynamic going in the Cartesian meditations, it all starts with the notion of pairing that occurs, this pairing between the, my body and the body of the other, which itself cannot be explained on the basis of then the outcomes. You can't begin to even separate the other body yet <laughs> from mine precisely because I don't yet have the other. Um, and so the interesting question then is, how does that pairing, pairing uh, uh, affect itself and take place? Um, and it may be that this is a case where um, we have a kind of um, a genetic account would actually prove to be interesting to us, which is begin to think of the development that occurs between parents and children. And the primary mode of interaction is entirely one of, of uh, uh, is, is entirely tactile in that relationship. And what emerges out of that is a kind of transference that occurs already at this level, uh, which doesn't involve any type of objectification, but nevertheless creates then this, this bond, this kind of link between the other uh, that you don't get later on. You can't, in fact, even in terms of the method of, of the fifth investigation, get that. And so the question then is uh, whether that would be um, interesting and sufficient to try and get this broader 
non-individualistic notion going that you need in order to then provide some kind of a broader basis on the which you can begin to make distinctions between the personalistic and naturalistic attitude. Uh, in effect, what it does, I think, I mean, the way a strong way to take that would be to say that that would be the point where something like intercorporeality is, comes into play, which is going to be quite different and dynamic from what he thinks of as intersubjectivity. So like a middle Pontian, uh, more, 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 like a, more like a middle yeah. uh, alternative. Except being worked out in terms of the, um, uh, not merely pointing in the sense that you still are going to get, what you're going to get out of this is still a pretty strong notion of, of acts, perceptual acts, and, and uh, you're going to be able to get out of this a pretty full-blown notion that allows you to do the kind of attentional analysis that will show off. Okay, but, but my, my problem with these, uh, perhaps one could call them, like non-individualistic uh, ways of reading or, or developing perhaps what Husserl is saying is that, uh, but, but this is a question back because it's, it's a kind of like uh, trying to understand what is going on there is that, that when one says that, uh, if one says that uh, Or does one is the idea that uh, there is a uh, non, in, non completely non individuated uh, embodiment from which emerge at the same time kind of parallel f by some process both my own body and the other the other's living body. So is this the main idea that there is a kind of uh, non Mm. You use for that. And it seems like you don't, uh, in order to try and understand how that nexus of subjects comes into play, you've got to have some kind of intercorporeal relationship going uh, that isn't going to be defined in terms that work for the kind of naturalistic and personalistic attitude. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a question, yeah. I guess. Maybe I should have made this mm. more open then. How, what is that? Uh, it's a really interesting move. That's why I'm. I'm mm. Or pairing. Yeah. But the, I mean, uh, which notion of pairing? Because uh, there is one notion of pairing in, in the Cartesian yeah, meditation right. fight. So. Yeah, there must be a body in that perceptual field which is uh, purified or kind of. Uh, isolated for, for, from all uh, references to other subjects, but no, not isolated from the reference to one's own subjectivity or egoic. And then the question is whether, whether the, there isn't, a, it's kind of almost a psychoanalytic question whether or not the, there isn't, the, the pairing isn't occurring already at the level of body to body before you even get anything like an ego in play. For him or for, well, because because not for him clearly, yeah. So so the question then is that, I mean the question can be this: Is it nonsensical to say, as he says, that when uh, if we if we are able to if we even are able to make this isolative reduction, uh, and he says you know, egoic perceptions, these are not. Uh, this is not a table because that would refer to others. This is not a pen that would also, for the pen, I would have to have a reference to others. But something appears there and has its, uh, uh, it's not a constant stream, it has its unities. So there is an appearance of something. Uh, and it appears to me. We can't perhaps use the word me because it linguistically refers to you. Let's forget about that. Uh, so, so that's a linguistic problem, isn't it? So for him, this makes sense. 
So we could either say that this doesn't make sense and have a critical argument that this, this is nonsensical. Uh, and I, I, I kind of hear you saying that the, perhaps it is kind of nonsensical and we have to take another road or starting point. And then it would have to be another kind of uh, pairing between some other kinds of uh, units than this sensing sensed and the something that is given to, to this sensing sense in this very primitive space, which is non-intersubjective. No, 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 I don't think, I mean, he's saying that it, it I mean, the lived body, the, the lived body or the other is constituted by this pairing. So it is a constitutive result of this pairing. So it's not that I detect, it, it's not that I kind of have this sensing sense here, and then the field, there stands out these lived bodies that somehow get this sense of lived from somewhere. But rather the sense of lived is constituted through this pairing which can't depend on them being lived, because they're not yet lived. What's the status of a body before the pair, of the other before, it, before the pairing occurs? You're back, you've got a chicken and egg problem then, because- Yeah, yeah, okay, but yes, I hear you saying that this, is, this can't work. No. Yeah, yeah, I hear, I hear that. Okay. But I don't share that view. <laughs> But well, yes, I understand, and I, I appreciate this, and I, I kind of also, of course I appreciate, I mean, I think most of people think that the fifth meditation is kind of crazy, yeah, that he, he or, or that he got into trouble, and then he tried to kind of sneak himself out from these troubles, and introduce new concepts, and all kinds of, you know, uh, you know, uh, trying to make us look elsewhere. But I, 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 I'm still trying to, uh, 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 spell out uh, it in other terms that, uh, and I think one one of the terms is that what is what is what is, what is given there in this uh, uh, sphere of onus is not the phys physical thing, in any sense of physical thing that depends on the others, and I think that that mistake is often made, and 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 if we get rid of that idea, then we perhaps can make a little more progress. We've got one. Uh Last question here. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. I, um, uh, let me start this. I think this will help, actually. So um, I, I haven't read Ideas 2 in a long time, but I've been reading the logical writings. So I want to talk, I want to ask you a question about the <clears throat> ambiguity of the use of expression mm -hmm. uh, here uh, and frame, frame it in the um, context of these lines of dependency that you're talking about, um, because uh, what is an expressive, uh, here's what's motivating my question. I'm quite interested in how we apprehend a living being as a living being at, at the most fundamental level, like infusoria or plants. So for example, Shaler in the um, uh, Human Place in the Cosmos talks about the plant as an expressive organism that expresses a vitality. Um, and this is the sense in which you seem to be talking about expression in the recognition of the other as a living that's, that's necessary to then the naturalistic attitude. But it certainly uses expression in a really quite different sense in the logical writings. Um, and then you also refer to expression as this, in the personalistic attitude as a significative sense, which refers me back to like the logical investigations and these, um, and the, so, I've been struggling with how to ask this question easily. Is it that we must live and function within a linguistic community to be able to then, um, in which we make judgments and express ourselves through that, then by which we can apprehend living beings as psychophysical entities? I think that's probably the easiest way to ask the question. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, okay. the question, yeah. Well, I think one has to be careful with the, I mean, I tried to say that uh, uh, the, the comparison to linguistic units in Ideas 2 is just a comparison, so it's an analogy. It's not 
expression in the same sense as in the logical discourse. But there must be some similarity there because it's an analogy. Uh, so he's saying that the bodily gestures and bodily postures and bodily movements are expressive in respect to spirit in a partially similar sense as linguistic uh, text carries meaning. So uh, I don't think that uh, we, I mean, the point is not that we uh, can only have uh, spiritual uh, bodies uh, if we are able, if you are operating in a, in a linguistic community. I think that he's kind of trying to ex ex exactly to use the analogy to say that some similar kind of relationship is already uh, in operation prior to linguistic meaning. But to spell out what that is, then is a, of course is a, is, a inter, is a problem of interpretation, and, yeah. and it's a hard one. But but I think that one it, it is not that he's kind of lending from that logical discursive uh, uh, world, yeah. uh, or secretly smuggling in something from there. I think he's quite explicit that it's just an analogy, just in a comparison. Uh, and the point is to say that in a similar fashion, as in in. Uh, in a, in a similar fashion, you have a sentence and you, you put that in, in you, you articulate it in, in constitutive parts. Each part carries meaning. So it's not that we, can, we end up with some kind of non-meaningful uh, units. And in a, his point is that in a similar fashion, the, the living body, its movements, its miniature movements, it, it's, it's, it's all its kind of constitutive parts are Perhaps the word significative is, is wrong word, but it's it are, are meaningful. They carry sense. So it's he just kind of makes this in order to say that there is no physical basis on which then something is added, and I think that's a, a good i good, good. I think it's a kind of uh, a, a, an idea that on which one has to build if one tries to understand uh, living bodies in in Husserlian framework. Okay. Thank, you very much. thank you. Thank you for thank you for all questions. To, Thank you. Uh, to wrap it up for now, but hopefully we can continue these yes. discussions throughout the day. Thank you again. Thank you.